Hello, and thanks, Elise, uh, for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to participate in this conference. Today, I'm going to speak about carcinoid heart disease, and we'll start off with how the normal heart functions. We'll talk about how neuroendocrine tumors cause heart disease or carcinoid heart disease. And then we'll talk about recommendations for screening of carcinoid heart disease, how to make the diagnosis of carcinoid heart disease, and then of course, treatment for the same. This is a animation of how the normal heart works. And we can see blue blood entering two big veins on the right side of the heart. The blood flows through two valves to the lungs where oxygen is picked up and then oxygenated or red blood returns to the left side of the heart and is pumped to the body. In individuals who have carcinoid heart disease, of course, the tumors are generally in the small bowel and metastasized to the liver. Tumor substances are released. Um, the vasoactive substances that are released can cause injury to the right-sided valves. And it's estimated that 20 to 50% of individuals with neuroendocrine tumors with carcinoid syndrome will develop cardiac involvement. So remember that the primary tumors are usually in the small bowel and metastasized to the liver. We can see several metastases in the liver, which is located below the diaphragm here. Serotonin-rich blood enters the bloodstream and drains directly into the right side of the heart. And this, it's believed the serotonin causes thickening and abnormal function of the valves then of the right side of the heart. And you can see those valves are thickened now, the right-sided heart valves. And that ultimately causes leaking of the valves. So there's backflow. Remember the valves should allow blood to go in one direction only. And there's backward flow uh, through these valves causing ultimately enlargement of the right heart chambers and then dysfunction. If you wanna hear this again or see it done in a different type of animation, I have a YouTube video that outlines the same process and there's the um, address for you. If you just type in carcinoid heart disease on YouTube, you can see an animation that goes through again, how the normal heart functions and then how carcinoid affects the heart. So ultimately the serotonin rich blood causes thickening and abnormal function of the valves. And if you're interested in the pathobiology of it, it's myofibroblasts and smooth muscle cells that lay, get laid down on top of the valve structure and cause these valves to become thickened and inefficient and ultimately cause leakage of the valve. So backflow of one or both uh, of the right-sided valves is generally what occurs. So as I've already alluded to, it's serotonin, which is felt to cause the valve disease and um, uh, the um, tumor that produces the serotonin then contributes to that. So patients who have carcinoid heart disease may have an asymptomatic period. They can have very severe um, valve disease and not have many symptoms. Ultimately, however, symptoms of breathlessness and fatigue occur, and then later in the process, swelling with fluid retention either in the abdomen called ascites or in the legs called edema uh, can also occur. Now, sometimes it's difficult to say are the symptoms of fatigue, breathlessness, and swelling related to heart disease, or is it related to something else such as liver, uh, disease, nutritional problems, uh, or something uh, else entirely. Which patients who have neuroendocrine tumors should be screened for heart disease? That's a common question that comes up. And i just show you a reference of uh, um, a, an article that um, a number of individuals uh, across the world actually contributed to and it's looking at diagnosis and management of carcinoid heart disease in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And there's a lot of information here that is of interest, uh, but for those of us who take care of individuals who have uh, neuroendocrine tumors and are being evaluated for carcinoid heart disease, this is of particular interest. So 
at the time of initial identification, it's worth asking about symptoms and signs of carcinoid heart disease. And if there are no signs or symptoms of carcinoid heart disease, then a blood test um, that measures a protein that comes from the heart, so-called BNP or NT proBNP, is a very reasonable test. And if this is abnormal or elevated, and or there are findings that suggest heart disease, then an echocardiogram or an ultrasound test of the heart uh, is what's recommended. An echocardiogram is really the best way to make the diagnosis of carcinoid heart disease. And I think in order to explain how this is identified, it's good to look at a normal echocardiogram. So we looked at how the normal heart works, and there you can see right ventricle as depicted by RV and right atrium as depicted by RA. And the valve that is between the right atrium and the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve. So that's a normal tricuspid valve there that you can see on your screen. Contrast that to the valve that you see here in a patient who has carcinoid tricuspid valve disease and how abnormal that looks. It's fixed and open, doesn't those two leaflets that we see, obviously there's a third leaflet too, uh, but those two leaflets don't even come close to touching each other. And then as we add color to that same patient, there's severe backflow or regurgitation. And so uh, consistent with severe tricuspid valve disease from carcinoid. And I think it's worthwhile just mentioning that Echocardiography, ultrasound test of the heart, can be the first clue to the diagnosis of carcinoid heart disease. Other tests can also be quite helpful. MRI or CT are frequently used, either as preoperative assessment or if we have challenges visualizing certain parts of the heart, the pulmonary valve, for example, or we need a better assessment of the right heart size or function, or to look for some other tumors in the heart, other types of um, imaging can also be performed. But echocardiography is the mainstay to the diagnosis. That brings us to management. And again, we go back to that reference and there's a lot of detail in here, but let me just tell you the Cliff Notes version. Watchful waiting for symptoms is what we tend to do. Um, and then if individuals have developed some swelling, it's reasonable to try a diuretic or a water pill to see if that results in improvement in symptoms. But it generally doesn't help with fatigue or breathlessness. It just helps with the swelling. And really, there are very limited alternative medical options available. So as we go back to our schematic here, for the patient who has developed severe leakage of one or both valves, the treatment of choice really is surgical valve replacement. At this point in time, surgery is the only option for the individual who's not had previous valve replacement. And here you see two valves replaced, and that would be a typical standard type of um, uh, treatment in patients that we see. I think the art of medicine is determining when is the best time to perform valve replacement in patients who have carcinoid heart disease. And that's something I think that we're still refining because we wanna balance the time of operation and alleviate symptoms, but recognize that there are surgical risks. And then of course, we start the clock on a new valve and how long will that new valve last? So I just wanna share with you just briefly uh, experience that we have here at Mayo Clinic. Um, we've operated on through 2017, 240 patients who had carcinoid heart disease, 70% had severe symptoms. And you can see that essentially all of them had their tricuspid valves replaced. Many had pulmonary valve uh, uh, disease and had intervention for that. And then left-sided valve disease was uncommon, 16%. And then uh, for sure, we've gotten better. You can see that through 2000, the chance of not surviving the operation or one month after surgery was pretty high, 17%. And that fortunately has decreased. So since 2000, I think with better treatment before surgery, better selection of patients, earlier surgical intervention, and then also really a comprehensive care team an informed comprehensive care team has helped to decrease that surgical mortality to less uh, than 10% and actually currently at around 6%. So from this information of 240 patients, we said that these individuals had 
really had improvement in symptoms after surgical intervention, that carcinoid involvement of the new valves, even the biological valves that were placed is very rare. And um, that earlier operation, that is when patients are not really severely ill, is uh, very uh, helpful and does decrease mortality. So improved survival has been seen in patients with carcinoid heart disease. And um, the reason for that is multifactorial. I think we identify patients earlier. There's a multidisciplinary care team approach. We pre-treat patients with octreotide and then have a team that really is familiar with the use of octreotide. Use it throughout the procedure and in the perioperative and post-operative setting as well. So what is the best timing or what are the indications for intervention? Certainly if patients have symptoms related to carcinoid heart disease. So fatigue, shortness of breath with activity, swelling, and that interfere with quality of life, it's a time to consider intervention with cardiac surgery. Right heart enlargement and dysfunction or prior to liver surgery, such as liver resection or transplantation is another indication for surgical intervention. And our surgeons replace the tricuspid and the pulmonary valve um, when those are affected. So take home points, remember that carcinoid doesn't just affect the liver, um, it can affect the heart and carcinoid heart disease occurs quite frequently. A screening test is a hormone called BNP or NT proBNP easy blood test that can give a clue to the possible diagnosis of carcinoid heart disease, but the ultimate diagnosis is made by echocardiography that identifies the valve disease and determines what treatment is required. Medical therapy can be used, but really ultimately the best treatment of choice is valve replacement th surgery and finding the right time is something that we're still working on identifying clearly. And I like to end on a positive note and to say that over the years we've recognized that um, interventions, all of the interventions that are being done for patients with neuroendocrine tumors have really resulted in great optimism and mar marked improvement in outcomes both from heart disease and also in general. And of course, the experienced multidisciplinary care team is required for state-of-the-art management. Thanks very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions.